Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Liam Greeley. Uh, on behalf of the Boy Studies Group, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we're streaming in. So in my case, that's the Larrakia people, for my inner city Sydney colleagues, it's the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation um, and other traditional owners. So we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and note that these sovereign lands were never ceded. Um, it's my very great pleasure to chair this panel, Boys Learning from Feminist and Gender Studies for Research on Boyhood. This is our third time presenting papers together after our panel at CSAA and our Boys Studies Colloquium last year. It's always especially lovely though to share our work with GCS colleagues, even if these bodies are now scattered far beyond the main quadrangle. I want to thank Tom on behalf of the group um, for all his help putting this seminar together. And also just to recognise the importance of continuity in seminar series such as this one, in the context of such major social disruption, but in particular disruption in security and distress in the university sector. So thank you everyone for taking the time to join this discussion uh, on top of everything else. So Catherine Driscoll pulled together this research group in the middle of last year, which now includes Catherine, Shauna Tang, Grace Sharkey, Jess Keane, Tim Staines, Tim Laurie, and myself. While all having a relationship to the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies, uh, we are among us different sorts of researchers with various conceptual and methodological expertise and differently placed in our careers. So in that sense, this has been a fun experiment in forming a new research group and working out how our different topic areas can orbit around collective concerns. So at its heart, we share an interest in how studies of boys and boyhood can benefit from deeper engagements with the insights of feminist and gender studies research. And the papers today variously consider what an affirmative feminist boys studies might look like. So we have five papers in today's panel. Uh, for brevity's sake, I'll simply introduce each speaker by name and paper title. Um, I'll hold up a sign at 10 minutes and one asking you to wind up around 12 minutes. Um, I think everyone who's not speaking until discussion at least is muted already, but other speakers can you just mute, mute yourselves uh, during the talks. We'll hold a discussion following the papers which Tom will coordinate, thankfully. Um, if you have a question, please post that in the chat box uh, with the question following a, a queue, I suppose. So, um, without further delay, please join me in not welcoming, however we do that, smiling, I guess, um, Catherine Driscoll to present the first paper titled, Why Affirmative Voice Studies? Hi everyone, I'm just trying to work out how I get the PowerPoint to show and still be able to see my uh, my text, so just bear with me for a second. Okay, are you seeing the right things now? Can you see the slides? I can see the slides and the, the sidebar of faces. I can't see any of your text. Definitely. Okay, great. All right. Um, thanks very much, Liam. So today uh, I want to build on these two pieces of writing that I've um, put up on the screen here. Uh, the first, some of you heard last December, and the second you can all read in this open access journal if you want to. So this paper is going to try and be um, bringing together an extension of that argument, although centrally uh, the former, working towards an article for a special journal issue that uh, all of this group are going to be part of. I want to start with two very different but equally familiar images of boys. Both represent adolescent high school boys staged in tableau that dramatise their own liminality and expose a range of tensions. In the first, the central boyfriends of Stranger Things are simultaneously a classic image of boys as agents with heroic potential, but also a group with diverse experiences of and access to power and possibility, including in relation to gender norms and ideals. In the second, a still from a viral video widely cir circulated as emblematic and symptomatic of toxic masculinity, private school boys dominate a Melbourne tram with a sexist comic chant, playing with the benefits of a patriarchal inheritance, even if this same scene evidently includes perspectives interrogating them. 
Both tableau dress these boys up in costumes, anchoring them in a history to which they have uneven and partial access. Costumes only ephemerally available to them and which reveal as well as conceal diversity and difficulty. The title of the TV episode is telling in this respect. I can say that I don't want to oppose these images, but the latter clearly dominates public discourse on boys, including scholarly research via debates over what Raywan Connell has called hegemonic masculinity and the patriarchal dividend. This framework has been used in different ways so that it might mean that boys in general benefit from the asset of their relationship to historical male privilege, or it might refer to a dominant social tendency in which the benefits of patriarchal history are returned unevenly to boys precisely to the degree that their specific performances and practices conform to and sustain misogynist versions of masculinity. Using either version of this concept, a feminist analysis of boy culture and boyhood defaults to critique, defaults, we could say, to the second image, where boys are of interest in terms of their actual or potential bad behaviour. Media discourse in Australia would suggest that feminists exclusively understand boys through such frameworks as patriarchal privilege and toxic masculinity. That we will be particularly interested, for example, in the way female characters are foils and objects for the heroism or anti-heroism of narratives about masculine development. So 20 or so years ago, when arguing for an feminist, affirmative feminist perspective on girls and girl culture, one that didn't relegate them to ephemerality, triviality, immaturity, superficiality, both artifice and innocence, or idealisation, Diane's character in Trainspotting seemed a useful touchstone to me. Although clearly overshadowed by Renton's crises and his enemy, Diane's minor story has her playing with girl stereotypes and girl-centred norms, while also having them imposed on her in the course of a life none of these are adequate to. Now such, now such arguments appear ready-made in the way Nancy and Barb in Stranger Things are devices for the trajectory of Steve's heroic redemption in season one. The same dynamic plays out for the adults in Hopper's characterization and is only heightened by the introduction of new masculinity monster narratives in later seasons. I mean, Billy. Indeed, there are a great many such readings of masculinity in Stranger Things, from bustle to men's health. I wasn't the only viewer eagerly hoping for Barb's resurrection from the upside down, only to have to settle for Will's release instead. Subsequent seasons have certainly tried to service that fan desire through somewhat clumsy insertions of skilled girls of all kinds that still work as minor players in comparison to the unfinished project of Steve's development. I'm not going to spend my remaining minutes teasing out this reading further, but I do want to use it to introduce some thoughts about feminist boy studies. As the example of Diane also attests, affirmative feminist girl studies never meant celebration, but it avoids presuming negation, presuming Diane is only a victim, a delinquent or immature. It means something more like productive in Gil Deleuze's sense, Guy Deleuze's sense, particularly in the sense that he uses it to refuse a model of subjectivity grounded in lack or any other deficit. In Girls, I made a lot of use of Deleuze's concepts of becoming, assemblage and the monitorian. Minoritarian. Minoritarian. <laughs> it's not surprising that this worked, given Deleuze's own elaboration of these ideas through the figures of Becoming Woman and the Little Girl. But the fact that these work so less easily to talk about boys merits some thought, because they are minors too. The absence of a politics that needs purchase on boys as a minority, or a philosophy that gains critical leverage from the boy as a figure of difference, leads to very different questions being asked about them. It is harder to talk about boys rather than girls in terms of triviality, superficiality, either artifice or innocence, and ephemerality. Even the most ordinary forms of boy culture have less banal connotations associated with multiple forms of violence, danger, and risk overwhelmingly. And their own minority status and their social liminality are overshadowed by the ostensible privilege of eventually becoming men. This returns us to Connell's patriarchal dividend and Connell's masculinity's thesis remains the most cited reference in current scholarship on boys. 
It also might be discussed in terms of what Pierre Bourdieu calls the symbolic capital enabled by historical privilege embedded in a habitus, an equally contentious framework in some respects that nevertheless raises interesting distinctions between symbolic association and practical experience and the work of misrecognition in sustaining expectations and shaping desires. Either way, an association with domination and the complex problem of tracking the asynchronous and many directional ways that gender norms shift or multiply has limited how boys are studied across a wide range of disciplines and approaches. Where to go then for the conceptual tools to tease out new ways of thinking about the boys on that Melbourne tram? The boys chanting, the ones not, the ones who lodged complaints about their peers, and the force exerted on them all by the ideas about youth and masculinity sewn into those private boys' school uniforms or built into the Australian street streetscape they are rolling through. This has brought me back to, to Deleuze again, now to his concept of a philosophy of capture. A philosophy of capture is one which uh, in which not difference so much as multiplicity and mutability are contained and interpreted in an endless being made what one is a priori. These points are particularly important because contemporary public discourse on boys is dominated by essentialism on the one hand and the at risk boy of policy solutions on the other. The existing field of scholarship is dominated by education as a scene and as a discipline and by generally sociological work on risk and harm reduction or on pedagogies of masculinity. But while boys viewed in this way have been ciphers for society in crisis, there has been little wider ranging analysis of the changing meaning of boyhood and little work mapping contemporary boy culture that explores both its visibilities and invisibilities. Even studied studies cushioned by distance from contemporary discourse on boys, such as histories of boy culture or anthropologies of coming of age, tend to absorb them into the broader category of masculinity, positioned as the problem of raising men and thus captured by their reduction to not yet men. The lives of Australian women and girls are entwined with the lives of boys and men, and the feminist ideal of an inclusive, equitable Australia must necessarily be as concerned about and invested in the lives and futures of boys as they are in women and girls. But that recognition seems largely aspirational at this point. There is relatively little feminist research on boys, either in Australia or internationally, and even less that approaches boys as other than obstacles to gender equality, or that considers the ways that feminism may be useful and productive for boys. The belief in an unbridgeable chasm between feminists and boys has become both a cultural and an intellectual problem, and one that feminists themselves are best placed to address. This is not an abstract problem and resolving it requires considerably extending existing research on boys. Given that all boyhoods today are lived in relation to the influence of feminist projects, both past and present, and this is the case in very historically and culturally specific ways, such research must historicize ideas about and experiences of boyhood and firmly place them in the cultural and historical context that give them meaning. An affirmative feminist boy studies, I speculate, must think about the everydayness of boys' gendered experience, including both where it engages with and where it avoids essentializing ideas about masculinity. Let's jump back to strange things for a fine example. This feminist affirmative approach to boys in boyhood would care as about Will walled up in a shadow version of his mother's house as about the question of Steve's redemption and pay attention not only to the social obstacle of Elle's or Billy's masculinity, but also to the diversity and creativity of boyhood manifest in the friendship of Duncan, Lucas and Mike. Certainly wouldn't think about boys as a subject, it would think about boys as a subject position and cultural category that involves much more than the developmental experience of masculinity. It might not only acknowledge where feminism has impacted boys' lives, but take that as a set of achievements that has created opportunities for thinking about boys as subjects of and participants in feminist knowledge. At the same time, it might insist that what has recently changed in contemporary ideas about and expectations for boys is not all related to feminism. But this does not make such changes any less important for us. Most of all, perhaps, it might undertake this project without positioning boys as problems simply because they are boys and attentively consider the values produced in and around boy culture with careful attention to context. 
Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, next up is Grace Sharkey with her paper, Bad Boys, Sad Boys, Incels and Jordan Peterson. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Good, Grace. Okay, great. So, so I apologize for um, the Zoom crashing. That's absolutely my fault. Um, but actually uh, works quite well for my paper. Um, so for those of you who don't understand what happened, uh, I tweeted about the seminar today just moments ago, literally past two, and said, you know, we're talking about, I'm talking about incels today on, on chat, uh, on Zoom. Um, by all means, jump on in. Um, and instantly, several people, obviously, with incel on their um, Twitter Google alerts, uh, jumped in and, and tried to start a fuss, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, so part of my paper today is going to be about justifying why I think the incel is a boy. Um, and they have proven <laughs> something there about immaturity. Uh, but that's OK. All right. So. Uh, my initial interest in this project was in thinking about how the boy is taken up in ideas about feminist futures. Uh, many of you will know that my previous work has been about pornography and anti-pornography feminism. And that boy is often taken up in that discourse as a figure of concern. What is he learning from pornography and how can we protect him in order to make the future better? But the boys I'm interested in today for our affirmative boy studies are unlikable boys, uh, the bad ones or the sad ones. So instead of thinking about feminist futures so far, my work has been situated in a feminist here and now, a world that has already been changed by feminism and about how the boy or about how some boys manage in this new world. In my broader project, I work with theories of crisis from Sarah Ahmed and of extractive relations from Ghassan Haj. But today, in the interest of time, I want to narrow in on one aspect, and that's Jordan Peterson and the boy who adores him. Peterson is a psychology professor from the University of Toronto and a public intellectual. He became famous via YouTube for his views on identity politics and political correctness. He uses claims of rationality and expertise to back up his less savory opinions. A New York Times feature on Peterson I will turn to later called him the custodian of the patriarchy. In a now famous Channel 4 interview, journalist Kathy Newman asks Peterson, oh, actually, I'm going to show you. I'm going to have Peterson talk for himself for a moment because um, part of it is his voice. So hopefully this will work and tell me if it doesn't. Jordan Peterson, you've said that men need to, quote, grow the hell up. Tell me why. Well, because there's nothing uglier than an old infant. There's nothing good about it. it people who don't grow up don't find the sort of meaning in their life that sustains them through difficult times and they're certain to encounter difficult times. And they're left bitter and resentful and without purpose and adrift and hostile and resentful and vengeful and arrogant and deceitful and, and of no use to themselves and of no use to anyone else and no partner for a woman. And there's nothing in it that's good. So you said, I mean, that... okay. So he says, there's nothing uglier than an old infant. That's his argument. And so this ugly old infant is my object. The boy who feels that a certain kind of manhood is no longer in his reach. A boy for whom Jordan Peterson has become a particularly seductive figure. So I want to do this using the incel. You may have heard the term uh, around the release of Todd Phillips' film, The Joker, uh, or this widely read piece from The Cut about how incels um, augment their faces to be more masculine um, with plastic surgery. Incel is a term used to describe those who are involuntarily celibate. Men who have the desire to have sex with women, but who have not been able to for at least six months. Again, that's the diagnostic criteria. This state of being is known as inceldom. Most believe that women cannot be incels, that they can only be vol cells or voluntarily celibate. Incels have been part of public consciousness since around 2014. They rose to prominence with the Isla Vista killings in May of that year by Elliot Roger, 
who made a YouTube video prior to the attack outlining his romantic and sexual isolation as his motivation. He attacked, among other places, a sorority house and has become an icon of incel -Bell. But is the incel a boy? Yes, I think we've decided today, yes. Uh, but I argue that it is not just his age that makes him so. The category of boy is, as we've uh, decided and, and discussed much as a group, is uh, about more than just age. Instead, incels make sense as boys in several ways. Their attachment to online spaces, their immature obsession with sex, their arrested development. They are boys because, by their own admission, they cannot yet become men. So the insult is often held up, especially in leftist and feminist circles, as a coherent object with a coherent set of beliefs. I want to push back against this impulse. While the fantasy of the incel can easily fit into narratives about misogyny, of men feeling entitled to women and their bodies, they perform this in a variety of ways that complicate this easy categorization. While I cannot do it justice today, one of the unsayable things about incels is how many of them are invested in racism, sexual racism to be precise, as a core part of why they believe they are unable to form romantic and sexual relationships. Some believe that the antidote to inseldom is just be white. And so curry cells and rice cells, um, as well as many others, are part of this discourse. So while the incel, or at least an easy fantasy of the incel, is a white man invested in resenting women, the complexities of who attaches to this label is far more varied. And so while they don't, uh, or while they, many of them argue they don't have a shared ideology, uh, one thing that does come back again and again is this idea of the black pill. So some of you will know about the red pill versus the blue pill from the matrix and how that's taken up by the men's rights activists. Um, and so for incels, they talk about the um, uh, black pill. The black pill holds that women's emancipation is causing mass insulin and deteriorating male-female relationships. And the only solution is reversing the sexual revolution returning traditions, enforcing monogamy, and restoring the natural subordination of women. So it's understood that feminism has created the conditions that have not only allowed, but have directly caused the creation of the incel. In the same incel wiki site, the entry on feminism is clear. Feminism literally creates incels. For incels, the world that feminism has created is not one in which, in which men can no longer be men. So this is something we often hear about feminism and masculinity. Men can't be men anymore. Incels don't believe this necessarily. They believe men and who get to be men still exist and they call them Chad. So Chads are handsome, they're white, they have wide jaws and strong chins and are sexually and romantically successful. Now that, not, now that women do not necessarily need to rely on a man for financial security and can participate in a post-sexual revolution world, men who had once been guaranteed a partner now no longer have that security. The difficulties they face in romantic and sexual connections are blamed always on an external locus, this sort of victimized agency. So you can see here, um, this is sort of the situation that they feel they're in. So this victimized agency, where they are both victimized and entitled, is key to why the figure of the incel is also a figure of the boy. Incels are trying to make sense of their place in the world. A world in which roles for boys are not as clear as they once were. Um, they are at once obsessed with and left out of what Lauren Ballant calls the good life fantasy. This is why Jordan Peterson's antidote to chaos is so seductive for the incel and I refer there to his book, The End of the Chaos. For the incel, they feel the residue of a good life is no longer available to them. A manhood that has been derailed by feminism. So Peterson provides a way out of the current, good, and the way out of the current world and a way toward the good life. Uh, the New York Times feature I mentioned on Peterson earlier um, is what would initially ignite um, the incel's interest in Jordan Peterson. So uh, when I presented this paper in uh, Brisbane, we didn't quite get to this part, so I'm excited about this bit. Um, asked about the 2018 van attack in which the accused, um, Alec Minnison, posted on Facebook before the attack, claiming to be an incel and calling Elliot Roger a supreme gentleman, this interaction takes place. I'm going to read it out. He says, 
He was angry at God because women were rejecting him, Mr. Peterson says of the Toronto killer. The cure for that is enforced monogamy. That's actually why monogamy emerges. Mr. Peterson does not pause when he says this. Enforced monogamy is, to him, simply a rational solution. I'm really enjoying Jessica Keane's face at this moment. Um, otherwise, women will only go for the most high status men, he explains, and that couldn't make either gender happy in the end. Half the men fail, he says, meaning they don't procreate, and no one cares about the men who fail. I laugh because it is absurd. You're laughing about them, he says, giving me a disappointed look. That's because you're female. So this moment was key to why incels gather around Jordan Peterson in the way that many of them have, not all, but many. He is cognizant of their struggles, clear that they exist and are valid and offers a solution, enforced monogamy. Not far from the sexual redistribution that more sinister incels are invested in. Of course, feminists have long critiqued the social structures that uphold enforced monogamy. Our own Jessica Keane has written about these structures. And Angela Wiley has argued that these systems are also always systems of whiteness, this kind of respectability politics. And Peterson, and this is one of my favorite things about him, he went on to defend his claims in this New York Times piece. So this was obviously had a lot of backlash about it. Um, and he wrote this post on his website, which I'm gonna read a part of. He made it clear that he did not want a handmaid's tale type of patriarchal social structure. He does not want to endorse the arbitrary dealing out of damsels to incels, but instead just what he calls the plain bare common sense facts. And he's very invested in always having the plain bare common sense facts. That monogamy decreases male violence and upholds a reliable family unit that women benefit from. This common sense idea, as with many of his ideas, is how Peterson offers an antidote to what he calls the chaos of modern life a chaos that the boys I'm invested in struggle with in different ways. And so to end, the incel is not a good boy, but our affirmative feminist approach is one where affirmative means thoughtful and wants to take boys seriously. Thanks. Thanks, Grace. Great to see the new add-on. <laughs> um, okay, who's up next? Uh, Jess Keane and Tim Staines are co-presenting, I believe, certainly a co-authored paper, um, are up next with their paper, The Temporal Logics of Prevention, Boys and Domestic and Family Violence Campaigns. Okay, um, I'm going to start and just do a very brief um, analysis here. Jess and I are looking at the representations of boys in two Australian domestic and family violence primary prevention campaigns. I'm looking at Stop It at the Start and Jess is looking at Respect Women. We're looking at the sort of public education commercials coming out of these campaigns. Primary prevention is premised on the idea of preventing violence from ever occurring. Um, it involves an intervention in the present for the sake of a future. And thinking about this kind of temporal structure of primary prevention got us thinking about the gendered nature of tempor temporality, um, especially in the re relationship between boy and man. We do look into stuff around masculine time and sort of temporalities of gender, uh, thinking about those sort of narratives of progression from boyhood to manhood, but I don't have time to go into that um, today. But I was sort of primarily looking at the relationship of the present boy to the future man, especially the trope of the boy as future perpetrator, um, which uh, I look at specifically in the Stop at the Start campaign. And then looking at this boy, um, we're trying to extend on existing um, DV frames that sometimes have a tendency to speak of masculinity primarily as a source of violence and harm. And in a, our affirmative feminist study of the boys, we try to acknowledge the limitations of thinking about the boy in that way and to see where we can think about the boy differently, work with the boy in the present. Um, so if we can look, go to the next slide here, this, this is from the long form version of the ad from Stop It At The Start. Uh, it begins with a boy who slams a door in a girl's face and sort of smirks at her. And we have various boys in the middle, like this one who um, takes an inappropriate photo of a teenage girl without her consent and sort of laughs and sends it around to his mates. And at the end, um, an adult male um, abusing his adult um, wife. Um, and if we can go to the next slide as well, this final um, adult male um, uh, flickers and becomes um, the boy that we saw at the beginning of the ad, suggesting um, that the boy 
has become this adult abuser, um, that there hasn't been a, a good enough primary intervention there, and that he has become a future perpetrator. Um, and it's this kind of like framing of the boy as perpetrator that we sort of wanted to question. Diedrich Jansen's notion of masculine time suggests that there are these developmentally gendered pathways, you know, between boy and man that sometimes involve uncompromising linearity and rigid chronologies. And I guess we see this, this representation as an example of that, of a sort of a rigid chronology between boy to male or adult male perpetrator. Um, and one of the risks of this kind of discourse is, as we know from Michael Flood, that men and boy Men and boys may resent portrayals and communication campaigns um, of men and boys as perpetrators, right? They may um, um, be alienated from this politics and not want to engage the feminist politics of primary prevention campaigns. Uh, but also we see the boy in the present as more complex than simply a future perpetrator. Um, and we want to know what it means to work with the boy in the present in all its complexity, rather than folding this kind of like imaginary um, uh, future onto the present boy. Um, and in the next slide, um, we see the sort of the faces of various boys in the various parts of the campaign. Um, Team so we have, again, the smoking boy, the laughing boy, and other boys that are reflective. Right there. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? You hear me? Internet connection unstable. Um, is Grace, my voice can coming through? Um, that you can hear Tim okay, and it's not my end. Uh, no, I had problems hearing Tim a little while ago. Maybe mute your video for a moment, Tim. You just dropped out. A couple okay. Uh, are you hearing me at all? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, sorry. So yes. Yeah, so in this particular. Um, in these particular representations, we can see that um, there are boys who are smoothly and unproblematically incorporating particular toxic masculine norms, right? Um, they're smoking, they're laughing. Um, but in our studies, in the gender studies and in the psychological literature that we looked at, um, these incorporation of norms is not necessarily as smooth as seems to be suggested by these ads. Um, there is contradiction and there is pain in the incorporation of um, masculine masculinity and the inculcation within masculine norms. Um, and so for, and for Michael Flood, um, he says that various authors argue that for men to acknowledge the pain of others and to challenge dominant definitions of masculinity, they must acknowledge and validate their own feelings, including pain, hurt, and fear. And so I guess one of the things that we saw was a risk of seeing the boy as only smoothly incorporating norms rather than having this kind of like uneven, even um, difficult or painful incorporation of masculinity, which seems to um, Jess, true sounds like we're losing. Of, um, that that sort of temporal, um, uh, that temporal. Um, Tim, could you go back a couple of sentences? We just lost you. Uh, and then if we okay. continue losing you, maybe Jess should take over. Okay. Can you hear me at the moment? Yeah, we can. Yeah. yeah but you have to go okay. back. Okay. Kind of smoking, okay. smoking boy. Yeah. Okay. So the smoking boy um, has a kind of smooth incorporation of masculinity. Um, but um, there, we found that there is also pain in that incorporation. And Michael Flood shows that if men want to acknowledge the pain of others, they have to also acknowledge their own feelings of pain, hurt, and fear. Um, uh, and that's an important part of primary prevention. So here, we think that by representing the boy as kind of folded into a, a future perpetrator, um, we're missing this kind of like temporal space where that incorporation is actually uneven, it's complicated, it's painful. Um, and we're also diminishing the possibility of imagining a world where boys, through feminist education, break the temporal narrative, constructing them as future perpetrators. We want to um, work with the boy in the present rather than seeing them only as this um, future, this, per this perpetrated figure in their future. All right, thank you, I'm gonna stop there. So I'll take over here, thanks Tim. Um, so the set of ads that Tim was looking at, these Stop It At The Start ad campaigns, um, are all 
about the kind of consequences of accepting everyday sexism or um, kind of ambient misogyny that floats around. So these boys are not witnessing domestic violence and until the very end of the long form stop it at the start scene, we're not seeing any domestic violence portrayed. And um, what instead we're seeing are instances of really casual disrespect towards women or carelessness with bodies or, um, and specifically carelessness with the bodies of uh, girls and women. In the ads that I'm going to turn to now, um, there's one key difference. So they're also primary prevention campaigns, but these ads depict domestic violence within them. So um, Tim mentioned that I was going to talk about uh, this set of ads called Respect women for our children's future which is a um, Victorian government initiative but I'm also going to throw in because um, I think it makes for an interesting uh, it's got some interesting differences this ad um, created by Pacifica Proud which, uh, which is a community-led um, Pacifica uh, New Zealand um, ad campaign and broader campaign it adds part of the campaign that's around ending um, and intervening in domestic violence in Pacifica communities so what these two ads have in common is that they, they depict violent fathers. So rather than having uh, violent boys or careless boys who might turn into violent men, these ads both feature um, fathers who are being violent towards um, mothers in, in the ads themselves. And all of these ads, so there are two ads in the Respect Women for Our Children's Future campaign, and then there's the one ad in the Pacifica Proud campaign, and both of them depict sons specifically as witnesses. There are no girl children in these ads. They're entirely boy children, which is interesting and different um, in relation to the Stop It at the Start campaign, which does have a, a lot of girls um, used as figures to, to shame adults into action. So in these ad campaigns, the ones that depict violent fathers, there's something significant about the fact that it's sons who are um, portrayed as the children witnessing the violence. Another interesting thing is that the children are uniformly, uh, well, almost uniformly silent. And there's no de clear depiction of the current impact of that domestic violence, of witnessing that domestic violence on the children themselves. So most of the time, the boys are kind of blankly um, kind of accepting or viewing the scene of the violence um, that their fathers are perpetrating towards their mothers. So those things, both of these ads have in common, but there are some things that are a little bit different. So um, the temporal logics of these two ads have a slightly different form um, compared to the one that Tim was talking about before. So the Respect Women for Our Children's Future campaigns has a kind of temporal leap going on that's showing just one scene from a domestic violence, a situation of domestic violence. It portrays a child witnessing that scene. And the only reference that it has to the future is this slogan here, respect women for our children's future. So whereas the Stop It at the Start campaign through various mechanisms folds the future into the present, this particular campaign kind of gestures towards a pretty vague future that's deemed as un undesirable and therefore needs intervention. The Pacifica Proud campaign has a slightly different take on it, which is more of a cycle of violence. So their slogan is breaking this, it's about break the cycle. And within the narrative itself, um, we like built into the narrative is the understanding that the father who is being violent, violent himself had a father who was violent and then is at risk of re reproducing the cycle um, with his own son. So there's a few things that we find interesting about these temporal differences. Um, firstly, there's something kind of curious about the way that they connect with logics of how you learn gender or specifically how you learn masculinity. So um, the Respect Women for Our Children's Future campaigns have both have, um, both of these ads have scenes where fathers are teaching their sons sports, specifically um, some form of football. And that that's kind of closely wrapped up in this notion that in some way or another, the father's actions are going to have an effect on the child's futures. Something I think is being implied about teaching your son masculinity or teaching your son violence. In the uh, Pacifica Proud campaign, there's a slightly different thing going on, which is a narrative about a man realizing he's becoming his dad. So it's um, rather than thinking, being prompted to think about what are you teaching your son, this one's got a little bit more of a, a cyclical um, loop, which is 
how are you becoming your dad? And, uh, and then how might that tell you something about what your son might be experiencing? But there's something else we're interested in here as well. Um, so the, these, we're saying that we've got three different temporal logics of violence here. There's a kind of line, a linear growth metaphor going on in the Stop It at the Start campaign. There's the leap metaphor of change something now for your children's future in the um, Respect Women campaign. And the Pacific a Proud campaign has a loop, um, a cycle of violence. And while all of these have in common some sense of the future and the importance of intervention in order to secure a better future, the little differences in exactly how that future is imagined in relation to the, the present, that temporal logic, has an effect on um, the logics of prevention that are implied by these ads as well. So the idea, the metaphor of growth or of you know, um, a kind of causal relationship between the present and the future it promotes the idea of a prevention of like a stopping prevention. So you stop it at the start. Um, the future for, for the sake of your children's future implies a choice. So you get these scenes in both, in both of the ad campaigns, uh, both of the ads in that campaign, you get a scene where a parent makes a choice to reach for help um, upon like reflecting on their child's uh, experience. Thanks Liam. Um, and in the Pacific a Proud campaign, um, you've obviously got the metaphor of breaking the cycle, which is a very, very common um, prevention metaphor. Excuse the plane going over. I live in Petersham. Um, I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> okay, so what we're curious about here is um, how these logics of prevention, like what they imply, um, both about how we ought to intervene in violence, because there's some interesting things about what they think we need to do, but also we're curious about, or we want to think more about about how, the ch how children specifically are addressed in these narratives and how boys are addressed in these narratives. Um, one of the things that we noticed really early on, for example, is that children figure primarily as a kind of, um, uh, like something through which the people, the adults need to act in the name of the child. So a mobilizing factor for the adults, um, but it's, not acknowledged in any of these ad campaigns, perhaps with the exception of the Breaking the Cycle ad campaign that Pacifica Proud has put together, um, that the children themselves might be suffering as a result of the violence that they are witnessing and experiencing. Um, so you've got this strange displacement where the, the current present day victims of violence, including the women who are um, kind of bearing the brunt of the violence themselves, but also the children who are witnessing violence, which is a you know, unknown harm to children, that present day harm is displaced in favour of this idea of securing a better future. Um, and so rather than acting in the name of the present or in the name of the actual harms that are happening right now, all of the ads gesture towards a, um, a future. And in that move, um, something about the present experience of children and of boys um, specifically is getting lost. Um, so I think that's all we've got time for. Um, look forward to questions afterwards. Thanks, Jess and Tim. Um, at CSA last year, it was in the sort of before time of technology and we couldn't get you Skyping in or whatever we tried to do. So it was great to see that today from both of you. Um, and, and as Jess just noted, a uh, quick reminder, if you've got questions, throw them up in the chat um, box and Tom will collate those. Okay, so next up we have Shauna Tang to present the paper, Notes on Trans Kids. Thank you, Shauna. Thanks, Liv. Can you see my desktop? Can you see my screen? Okay, I'll jump right in. Um, so I will be looking at uh, this documentary called Trans Kids, uh, produced by Helia Medallia, um, to consider the boyhood possibilities of transmasculine children in Israel. Um, the documentary follows four Israeli children or teenagers over a period of four years as they undergo gender transition. Um, in this presentation, I will focus on the boyhoods of Noam, Offrey and Liron um, and their process of gender transformation. 
So as part of a panel asking after an affirmative feminist study of boys, I'm interested in the everyday lives of the three transmasculine children um, in the documentary. Uh, specifically, I want to ask after three questions. One, what are the community support systems and opportunities for transition offered to transmasculine children in Israel? Right? So this is a question of gender transition and um, of becoming a boy. Right? Um, but I'm also interested in questions of age and development um, of these trans children. So my second question is, uh, what are the pathways uh, available to these transmasculine children in their development from boyhood um, to manhood in Israel? Right, so taking one and two together, I'm interested in the possibilities for gender transition for the three transmasculine children and also their pathways and promises of a kind of... Um, um, male futurity, right? Um, and I think this documentary makes a um, interesting case of the ease with which one becomes a boy and one becomes a man in Israel. Right? And in the third section of this presentation, I want to make some early notes on thinking through an affirmative feminist project for these boys. I'm going to begin uh, with an opening scene. Hello, one. Hear me, no one's אני מבינה שאנחנו החלטנו לשמר פריון, שימור ביציות, לפני שמתחילים את התהליך של שינוי מין. אני הבנתי נכון? כן. מצוין. כשאנחנו עושים שימור פריון, זה אומר שבן אדם הולך לעבור איזשהו תהליך שיכול לפגוע בביציות שלו בצורה בלתי הפיכה. ואנחנו רוצים לשמור את הביציות כדי שנוכל להשתמש בהן אחר כך, אחרי שהתהליך הבלתי הפיך יבוצע. והתהליך הזה אפשר לעשות רק בהפריה חוץ גופית. בגדול, התהליך הזה אומר שאנחנו, יחד עם הרבזת לירון, אנחנו מתחילים לקבל זריקות, הורמונים, שהמטרה שלהם היא לגייס כמה שיותר זקיקים בתוכם יש ביציות, ובסוף עוד זריקה שאחריה אנחנו נוכל לשאוב את הביציות האלה, להקפיא אותן ולשמר אותן. בסדר? עשיתם כבר לצעירים כאלה את ה... שאלה מצוינת. התשובה היא כן, ולצעירים יותר. הסיבה הייתה שונה. לא החלפת מין, אלא סיבות אחרות. הוא הראשון שעושה את זה מהטרנסג'נדרים של השימור פוריות? לא, אצלנו? כן. לא, אבל מתחת גיל 18 כן. Right, so um, already in the early scenes, we get a sense of the social support system and medical technologies afforded to transmasculine um, children. Right, we see Livon and his supportive parents visiting the female fertility clinic. We see a medical professional well-versed on fertility preservation as part of gender reassignment by right, dispensing advice on how the reproductive capacities of young transmasculine bodies can remain intact as they undergo sex reassignment surgery. Right. Now, the forms of support and services available to a young transitioning child attests to something quite specific about the sexual modernity of Israel. In Israel has one of the most um, stellar LGBTQ plus rights record in the world. Um, a large and long-standing body of queer feminist scholarships have been studying the sexuality politics of Israel and the rising status of gays and lesbians uh, in the context of Israel's um, homo-nationalism. Um, a point I will flag here and return to in the conclusion of this presentation. Um, the 1990s has been called um, Israel's gay decade. This was a time when uh, protections against workplace discriminations were put in place, um, when there was increasing institutionalization of same-sex partner benefits, and when homosexuality was legalized in the Israeli Defense Force. Right? A publicity poster for the Israeli military proudly states, you know, when the Middle East can gay officers serve their country, and another announces, you know, in Israel it's okay to be gay. So Tel Aviv has been named as um, the world's best 
um, gay city. It hosts one of the world's largest uh, gay pride parades. Um, furthermore, um, assisted reproductive technologies are provided at no cost um, to women, including lesbians. This is relatively unusual. In a survey of 62 countries, like only 14 allow lesbians to use artificial reproductive um, technologies. Now, for transgender people, um, national health insurance covers hormone replacement uh, therapies and um, sex reassignment surgeries. Transgender people can gain legal recognition of their gender without undergoing um, forced sterilization. Um, this is a non-exhaustive list and shows only some examples of how LGBTQ plus friendly um, Israel is. Right? So it is in this context um, that we see extensive community support for transgender children in the documentary. So a, a sister proud and protective of her transgender brother, uh, Noam's family participating in a local pride parade um, Ofri having an open discussion with his cisgender male friend about coming out as trans um, to their scout group. Um, so here we get sort of different model of boyhood, right, marked by um, relationality and so actual deep conversation between boys that disrupt normative constructions of boys as at best aloof in their friendships, at worst um, aggressive in their relationships. Right? But here the boys talk, right? Uh, they talk about Ofri's coming out. And Ofri stays self-assuredly. It's not a secret. Everybody here knows, right? Gesturing towards wider social acceptance. Um, so there is there is peer and familial and community support for transgender boyhood. Um, maternal figures play a central role if somewhat fraught a role um, in supporting their son's um, transitioning process. Um, in the focus of mother-son relations in the documentary, there is a, there's, an, there's an ossification of gendered categories and almost a repudiation of uh, the feminine, right? Through the portrayal of mothers as um, overwhelming, um, being irrational and emotional, um, in contrast you know, to the boy's assertiveness and uh, decisiveness, um, in contrast to um, rational male medical expertise authoritatively prescribing um, masculinity. Right? Um, I'll give you one scenario, I'll skip this and give you one so כאשר אנחנו ממקמים את הפתמה במקום שאנחנו רוצים. אני חושבת שזה בגיל צעיר זה לטובתה. לטובתו. לטובתו. סליחה, אני עדיין לא הפנמתי. הכל אצל צעירים יותר אנרגטי, זה נכון. הכל יותר אנרגטי, ויש להם יותר רזרבות. בסדר גמור. אני רוצה שר שתישאר לי עוד שנייה אחת פה. בסדר? אנחנו מורים. קחו את זה ללירון. אני רוצה לשבת ל... אני, יש לי שאלות לעצמי, שאני אומרת, אלוהים, אז זה לא גבר וזה לא אישה. זה לא, זה בעצם לא שום דבר שלם. אתה אומר, לא, נולדת גבר ואתה תמשיך להיות גבר, זה לא בדיוק גבר. למה לא? כי אין לו את האיבר של גבר, אבל הוא לא יהיה גבר לעולם, הוא לא גבר. אלוהים, איך אני אסביר לך את זה? זו דעתי. מה הופך אותך לאישה? זה לא שד או, או איבר מין כזה או איבר מין אחר, אלא זה מין משהו פנימי, הוויה פנימית, נשמה עמוקה, שמגדירה מה שאת. הנשמה הזו אצל עופרי היא גבר, ושם זה לא חצוי, זה לא חצי גבר חצי שם, זה גבר מוחלט. את משדרת לי איזה מין תחושה של חוסר שלמות עם התהליך. לא, איזושהי לא תחושה לא. שאת עוד לא מבינה עד הסוף, לא הסוף כן. את מה שהוא עובר. זו התחושה שאת משדרת לי. זה מכניס לסביבה איזושהי אי יציבות רגשית. והבקשה שלי אלייך, לפחות בכל מה שקשור בניתוח, בסביב הניתוח, במקום שבו אני יכול לעזור, זה אחת משתי דרכים, דברים. או... לקבל, להיות שם בפשטות של זה, או להתרחק קצת. 
Right. So here we see very clear um, gendered scripts. Uh, we see the availability of medical expertise um, earlier for fertility preservation, here for breast removal, um, and also for counsel general counseling. Um, and all three trans masculine children um, undergo um, top surgery at the age of 16. Right? So these cultural and technological productions enable an uncomplicated occurrence of boyhood for trans masculine children. So in this second session, and I'll talk through this quite quickly, I want to address the very clear developmental pathways from boyhood to manhood um, available to trans masculine children. Right? And the vehicles are um, religion and the military. Uh, this is a post-surgery scene of Offrey returning to the synagogue, um, putting on the young book, um, ushered by his mother into um, the threshold of masculinity. And, and Noam on this side um, is having a conversation with his rabbi on the integration of a religious identity um, in his um, transgender selfhood. Right? So besides religion, um, the military is the other um, strong symbolic structure providing a kind of ritual and route to becoming a man. Right? Um, I won't have time to talk about the military, so you just have to trust me when I say there's a lot of discussion in the documentary about the boys joining the military, um, and also the military featured very saliently in the boys' narratives of their futures. Okay. Um, so I'll skip this, um, and um, let's move on to my last slide. Uh, the third point I want to make, I think a good place to begin conceptualizing a feminist project on trans masculine kids is to go back to that queer feminist scholarship on Israel, which I said earlier that I'll come back to. Right now, this scholarship, led notably by Jasper Poir, um, have studied the sexuality regulation and politics of Israel as part of um, Israel's homo nationalism. Right? That is, um, no LGBTQ plus development in Israel is independent of its history. Specifically, its debilitation as a Jewish population historically in World War II and the Holocaust. No LGBTQ plus um, development is, in Israel is also in, independent of its contemporary international relations, particularly with regards to Israel's actions in Palestine, its alignment with Western progressive values versus the, the backward, repressive, and homophobic Islamic. Um, nation of uh, Palestine, thus justifying Israel's continuing um, military action as uh, defense of freedoms, including sexual freedom. Right? So the argument is that all LGBTQ plus developments in Israel, its acceptance and folding of forms of queer life into the national body is part of the state's nationalist project right, to rehabilitate and reproduce the Zionist nation as distinct from the Muslim Middle East. Right? So the, the nationalist mandate for strong, capacitated, militarized bodies and trains trans male bodies to recreate an elevated homo-nationalist masculinity. Now this critique of structures, right, of the state, of its uh, nationalist project, of its history and international relations is the broader queer feminist project and it is an encompassing framework. But um, to think specifically about trans masculine children in the terms of this framework makes me attentive to, if skeptical about the options and opportunities available to trans masculine children that is potentially, potentially reducible to their inclusion in state nationalist projects. Right? Their productive futurism secured through assisted reproductive technologies as a clear contribution to nation building, the plasticity of the transgender child's body and its potential to be molded into a robust, energetic Israeli national male, always ready to defend the Jewish nation in their manhood. All these make me wonder, are these children another instantiation of homo-nationalism? Right? Arguably, these children and their plasticity are the state's easiest biopolitical targets to convert trans bodies into strong masculine bodies that resurrects the nation. But then again, right, what does it mean to constitute trans masculine boys as yet another instantiation of homo-nationalism? Do they potentially play into discourses of victimhood ready to be mobilized as a problem that's in many ways uh, not affirmative and conceivably anti-feminist? 
how might we not dismiss these trans masculine children and pay attention to what they are doing, think about the options available to them and why they take the paths they do. But how might we see and respect and sort of give full positivity to their set of choices made in the specificity of their lives rather than be caught up in reactive dialectics. I have no answers yet, um, only notes that place these questions in productive tension within a feminist project. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Um, so we've come to our final paper on the panel. Uh, next up is Tim Laurie, and his paper is titled Egalitarianism as Force in Australian Cinema, The Case of Animal Kingdom. Thanks, Tim. You there, Tim? We can't hear you, Tim. Just give Tim a moment. No, Tim, I can't hear you. I need to exit and re-enter, although that might take a bit of time. Has Tim been made a host? Is that an issue? No, Tim, yeah. the host, he said the host and is unmuted, so I'm not sure why we can't hear him at the moment. No, thanks, Jess. No, still can't hear you, Tim, sorry. We, I might, can... we could maybe, turn, if everyone turns their video off, we mute all the videos and we see if that helps. Otherwise, you could exit and re-enter, possibly. It looks like he's exited. <laughs> Tim just popped up in the waiting room for just a second and he then disappeared. So hopefully he'll come back. I have my finger over the button and I still miss he's him. He's back, he's back. Um, I'm unmuting him. Tim, can you hear us? Can... No, I can see that you're trying to talk, but we can't hear you. Ah. That. Oh, try again. There you are. Just 
that was noise, Tim. I heard you. Can people hear that? Yes. Yay. 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 Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what I did, so I don't know if I can fix it if this happens again. Um, post the disabled participant screen sharing. Um, can that be enabled? Sorry, yes, it can. I'll just turn it back on for you. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Cut from the group, Tim. Okay, should be right now. Okay. Uh, lucky second time. Okay, so everyone can hear me now. Okay. Um, okay, I'll try and get straight into it. Sorry about the delay. Um, so my focus today will be on masculinity and boys in Australian cinema and a brief case study of Animal Kingdom. Um, I'll, I'll skip some preamble to get straight into it. So point general tendencies in Australian films about uh, masculinity, which loosely correspond to two methodological choices for film scholars. Uh, so there are what Lucas called spallocentric masculinities in films like Man from Snowy River or Crocodile Dundee, in which some kind of idealised masculinity is contrasted with or brought into relief with signs or embodiments of femininity, and which seems to call for a study of archetypes. A study of boys in Australian cinema in this context could begin by looking at structures of imitation or emulation as boys look to older men as models and by identifying early signs of bad or toxic masculinities in boyhood. The problem with any such approach is that this elides a wide diversity of masculinities that can be presented or worked through as social ideals and that the socialization of men uh, itself uh, as homosocial relations does not necessarily depend on all men subscribing to the same archetype or model. In this context, Rose Lucas points to a different tendency in Australian films. There are enduring patterns of storytelling around homosocial masculinities or what is often labelled as mateship in films like Gallipoli, um, but also evidence in films that are still more critical of these forms of friendship and particularly forms of white masculinity, such as Romper Stomper uh, or The Boys. These films thematize relationships or conflicts between different masculinities. It is not always a because power operates quite differently in Films that illuminate contrast between men within a wider gender order um, align more closely with the sociology of masculinity in Australia, which, as mentioned by Catherine, draws frequently on the concept of hegemonic masculinity elaborated by Raywan Connell and others since the 1980s. Hegemonic describes the patterns and practices and shared understandings that sort of pass as common sense and that enable men as a group to secure power and dividends over women and in doing so, establishing hierarchies between men. The analysis of hegemonies provides an alternative to the study of archetypes. For example, hegemonic formations of masculinity in the Supreme Court of New South Wales um, need have nothing in common with the types of masculinity found in the inner West punk scene. When looking at boys in Australia, we then ask not only uh, what role models are available to them, but also how are boys positioned in relation to the forms of power enabled and licensed by different kinds of masculinity. This question is less about masculinity as an image or a copy and more about a situation to be worked through. Uh, as an example, I want to consider the film Animal Kingdom 2010. Now, Animal Kingdom could have been a film about the sort of tragic fall of white Australian male archetypes. It's a crime drama inspired by the story of the Pettingill family in Melbourne, uh, members of which were accused of killing police officers in 1988. We follow the character Jay. Um, after the death of his mother, Jay goes uh, to live with his grandmother and uncles who are caught up with armed robbery. Uncle Baz, played by Joel Edgerton, in this film, is an exemplar of the raw, easygoing masculinity that, as Christina Gottschall notes, has become internationally recognisable as the, the Aussie bloke. Resourceful and adaptable, practical, good in crisis, but otherwise laid back, 
Uncle Baz appears in Animal Kingdom almost as a prospective role model uh, for Jay. Uh, if this had been a film about Jay and Baz, it would have fit comfortably within the coming of age mold uh, in the vein of films like, say, The Combination, where boyhood and young absence stands on one side of a sort of liminal journey leading towards maturity and, of course, a loss of innocence. But this isn't a story about Baz at all. He's abruptly shot uh, early in the film. There's a lot of spoilers in this talk. Um, Uncle Craig is another fam familiar type of uh, white Australian masculinity on screen. Um, and again, he's much in the mode of the sort of Aussie bloke in countless crime and war dramas. But Craig too, a police relatively early on as he desperately runs out onto a farm. It's actually the only time that we leave the suburbs in Am it's as if Craig's death signals the non-viability of the landscape through which so many iconic images of white Australian masculinity have been forged. But the men left behind tell a more interesting story, at least to me, about masculinity. There's Jay, who barely speaks for reasons I'll explain, but we do occasionally hear his monologue, and I, and I like this section. Just ask, what they just do whatever they're doing, you know? This is where I was, and this is what I was doing. After my mum died, it was just the world I got thrown into. I like this line as a rebuttal of any grand moral narrative about Jay's character. He's placed in an environment uh, dominated by violent men. Violence becomes something he's sort of part of. Whether or not he's for or against violence doesn't matter that much because he is just where he is. Also left behind is Uncle Pope, played by Ben Mendelsohn, an actor described by Scott Shaw as a quintessential larrikin or rogue of contemporary Australian cinema. Pope has a frightening history of sustained violence and eventually kills Jay's girlfriend. So violence against women is the culmination of a conflict between men in Animal Kingdom and actually a few other Australian films are plotted in that way. But Pope is not a chopper style character. Pope is hardly notable for his muscular physique. He's not laid back or jovial. And although heterosexual, uh, Animal Kingdom presents Pope's sexuality as predatory and creepy. He's not an Aussie bloke by the measure suggested in most films scholarship. Nevertheless, Pope is verbally coercive through his invocations of masculinity. For example, he accuses his brother Darren, a minor character, of being gay just in order to elicit discomfort and defensiveness. Um, and I'll read out this dialogue. I'm no Ben Mendelssohn, so I'm just going to try and convey to you um, some of the threads here. Uh, P for Pope. D for Darren. Pope, I don't care whether you're gay or you're not gay. I just want you to talk to me about it, you know. Making yourself a drink, Darren, yeah. What is it? Uh, it's a bourbon and coke. Bourbon and coke's not a very gay drink, mate. I think, look, if you're a gay man, if you are, and if you want to make yourself a gay drink, just go ahead and make yourself a gay drink. This could be a moment of what David Plummer calls homophobia phobia where Pope exploits Darren's fear of homophobic harassment actually quite independently of anything to do with Darren's sexuality. And we just don't learn anything about that. Pope increasingly interrogates Jay as well, especially as Jay becomes a liability when interrogated by police. Again, Pope asks Jay just to talk to him. Uh, if you don't want to do anything because you're scared, is it because you're scared? All right, if you are, I just want you to tell me about it. Just talk to me. Here I want to offer a slight provocation, which is that Pope's increasing efforts to control Jay actually take place by way of mateship. Okay, so Animal Kingdom is a long way uh, from idyllic depictions of Australian mateship commonly identified sexually. Um, Butera, Karina Butera characterizes traditional mateship as loyalty, non-pretentiousness and stoicism, which combine with fairness, self-sufficiency and egalitarianism. But clearly this tradition is a sort of contrivance of sorts, so much so that some scholars like Clive Moore dismiss the ideal of mateship altogether as mythology. Mateship has often been used to distinguish uh, Australianness from Britishness, whiteness from multicultural and Australia, and men's friendships from friendships with or between women. Nevertheless, Butera offers an account of mateship as a situation, which I think can help with animal kingdom and add something to say uh, about hegemonic masculinity. So Butera writes, there is a higher degree of free will associated with friendship than mateship, where individuals can freely choose to be friends 
and with who they want to be based on their personal preferences and judgment. This stands in contrast to the traditional accounts of mateship where men were drawn together through hard or war and to define mateship would, be, uh, would mean risking isolation or ostracism. I find this distinction useful because it frames mateship not as a personal or even interpersonal virtue or quality, but as a circumstantial imposition. Mateship is not a relationship that men choose, but an unchosen entrapment that men are required to navigate. And that is commonly naturalized or valorized through myths about masculinity. In this context, we can read the egalitarianism of mateship a little differently. In contrast to the heroic individualistic values of Hollywood, egalitarianism and, and peer group solidarity among men are virtues commonly promoted in Australian cinema and remarked upon a lot in scholarship in Australian cinema. But the ideal of egalitarianism can also be read as an imperative not to acknowledge hierarchy, which creates its own kinds of harm. For example, a boss can en enact gestures of mateship with all of his employees, but this can simply mean that if workers want to dispute their pay, they have to break these obligations of mateship. To talk about there even being hierarchy is how to let down the group. We can see how gender-based and race-based exclusions from mateship are also managed in this way. To question what mates do is to question a supposed ethos of egalitarianism, even as much as this works primarily to establish hierarchy. We're all mates here, right? Okay. This is the kind of mate that Pope is to Jay. Pope has power over Jay. Pope could kill Jay or his family members. But mateship operates in the film as a disavowal of this power, which is also a reproduction of this power. I just want you to talk to me about it. Just talk to me. I tried to suggest with this example that rather than trying to identify the essential traits of masculinity on Australian screens, it could be more useful to think about masculinity as a circumstance or situation where, in particular here, boys and young men are made vulnerable by the social worlds that older men seek to perpetuate. Like Romper Stomper, or more recently the film Snowtown, the differences between adult men in the animal kingdom uh, and the stuckness of young men in relation to older men forecloses any possibility of a linear coming of age narrative. In this context, mateship or egalitarianism becomes a sort of poison chalice, a promise made to do away with hierarchy by silencing those who would name it. It is this kind of encounter with regimes of masculinity. Uh, it is in this kind of encounter that I hope to locate the boy in future iterations of this research. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Tim. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for sticking around and for the papers, Catherine, Grace, Shauna, Jess, Tim and Tim. Um, we'll move into a discussion. So just put your name on the speakers list in the chat box. If you have a question, I believe Tom is going to unmute everyone. So we'll see how that goes. So um, Elspeth. Please. Oh, we, we had, sorry, Elspeth's muted still. Um, we, had, we had one more question before Hel Elspeth, which is Helen from Helen Greenwood. So, but Helen is also muted. So let me just, um, um, I'll just unmute Helen and then. Um, I'm going to leave it to you, Tom. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Okay. I hope. Um, thank you for all the papers, they were great. I was just really struck by Shauna's paper, partly because I'm doing some work in the area of um, looking at Jewish food, so I'm, my roads are leading to Israel. Um, and also because I have nieces and nephews who've come back from Israel, having spent the year there. Um, and they've come back vegan and with raster hair and sexually fluid and a whole range of things. So um, it's, you've just answered a lot of questions for me about what's going on and what they experienced, which they weren't able to tell me. But my question was also that this whole ongoing program of with young people, taking them from the diaspora to Israel, means that you have this toing and froing and feeding of ideas and going in and out. And there's a whole range of other agendas, like trying to protect the young people stop them from assimilating, stop it from losing them. And I'm just wondering how, you know, and of course the history's there, and you said the international relations and the state nationalist project, but there's also the project with 
the Jews abroad too. And it just seems to me that this, it just struck me that this is one way to keep your, keep the, the young people engaged with an Israel as well. I don't know. It's, it's just a range of reactions that may or may not work as a question for you, but I'm sure you'll pick something out of it. Yeah, I guess um, I am so fundamentally interested in the ways in which um, uh, young people connect um, to these ideas. I, um, there was no sort of uh, clear connections um, in the documentary. I, to be honest, this is sort of my sort of entry project into um, the field of transgender studies. And I'm learning about this real um, sort of um, at a really basic level. Um, but yeah, but it does uh, sort of it is, it is really about um, this whole um, question of how do we read young people, right? Um, do, we, do, do we read them as sort of agentic subjects or um, uh, do we read them as um, people um, interpolated into ideologies, which is also a question that I deal with a lot in Singapore, right, where um, ideological work, political ideological work is um, very strong, right? Um, and whenever we talk about Singaporeans being very quickly interpolated into national ideologies, um, you generate a lot of um, resentment and critique of your, of your work. Yeah, so it is, it is a question that I'm grappling with. Thanks. Uh, we had Elspeth next. You should be able to unmute yourself. Or I can unmute you. Yeah. There you go. Um, such power, Tom. <laughs> um, thank you all for a fantastic um, panel. Um, really, really interesting in so many different angles. Um, and I guess this is just more a... Um, to get you all to comment a bit more about um, nomenclature. Um, I mean, I find it interesting in... In Tim's, um, Tim Laurie's talk, it tended to be more about masculinity um, and young men. Uh, whereas, um, you know, for, for Catherine, it's definitely boys. Um, for uh, Grace, I love that definition that boy is more than about age. Um, so I just wondered if you all wanted to talk, I'm sure you've given your wonderful research group and, and your fantastic ARC proposal, by the way, um, that you, know, you will have thought about the, these issues. I mean, uh, when you think about how um, for gals became kind of, no, you couldn't call women gals, and you could, you know, um, what's going to happen with trajectory of boy or boys? I guess I'll say something quickly and then maybe the others will want to say something. Of course, we have talked about that and as, as you would have expected and we've um, talked about the, the way in which um, boy needs to be opened up as a conjunction of um, youth and masculinity in the same way that girl was. Um, over the over recent decades, but at the same time, we need to pay attention to um, boy as an idea uh, rather than as a a category, a specific demographic category of um, age and biology. So, um, boy is an idea that's at work in the relationships of authority and maturity and immaturity that. Um, Tim Laurie is talking about in those films whether or not anyone uses the term boy to describe um, the characters involved. Um, so it's, it's a matter of um, focusing on, on those ideas and how uh, relationships between um, not just uh, gender and age but between ideas about maturity and power um, are mobilised around a kind of experiential category of boy, not just the word boy necessarily. So thus, you know, in Stranger Things, there's clearly masculinity involved in the narrative of um, Elle's development as much as 
um, her eventual boyfriend, Mike, um, and boy is a category that can encompass a wide range of ages. So that's what I've got to say. So other people might like to step in. I have one extra thing maybe to, to add to that if people can hear me. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question. And, and in a way, there's also just an answer from the viewpoint of film study. Films encouraging people to view men who are outside of the biological range that the boys usually spoken about as having endearing boyish qualities or, or where boyishness is actually part of um, the tragedy of, of the film. So I think that um, you can see that in that film, The Boys from 98 with David Wenham, but also Cedar Boys. Um, so they kind of have moral tales about why boyishness is still a problem. Um, but, you know, they're often they're men in their 20s being seen as boys. But then there's also like The Walk Boy. But again, that's positioning someone in his mid-20s as a boy that's much more about his boyishness and his playfulness um, and his disobedience. So it's just a set of qualities rather than a biological age. Um, so for, for sure, I think you could sort of look at how is it that cinema is shifting what people imagine the boy could be or the appropriate age range. Yeah. Does anyone else want to respond to that, Grace? Um, yeah, I think that uh, one of my concerns always with, with working with this idea was that how will I make it clear that the insult makes sense as a boy? But after doing the work and talking to the group, um, you know, it's really about pushing what boy could mean. Um, and so those sort of attachments became quite easy to meld and it, it helped us, it helped me sort of understand that boy means so much more than just, yeah, this demographic location. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I'd add really quickly, Elspeth, um, on the CSA panel, I gave a short paper on boys and I think it was called something like the age of boyhood where I think I was probably less interested in gender and more interested in the age question and thinking about boys contra youth which is probably a category I've worked with more in the past um, and I guess in that sense I was looking at Billy Madison and other Billys in films in Todd Salon's films and thinking about how Adam Sandler in particular and Billy Madison and elsewhere is um, is a boy in a way that is quite distinct to the other versions of Arrested Adolescence that we see men do on screen and in part that in those films, in Todd Solon's films especially, um, it, it is about a, a different sort of relationship to, with, between boys and fathers. Um, but then also thinking about how that distinction is made within particular governmental models or pedagogical models. So, you know, boyhood is a stage about developing competencies of a particular sort contra how we might think of youth as about sort of um, outward orientations to the social or developing a project or finding something to identify with or commit to a sort of Erickson thing. Mm. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And um, Tim's uh, comment just now about boyishness, which is you're know, always taken to be kind of endearing, I think. Or at least when I talk to my butcher, you know, when he shaves his mustache, he's like, oh, I got my boyishness back, you know. Um, but, I mean, I like the way that, um, you know, it, it just all of this discussion breaks up um, youth cultures so, um, you know, so productively. I mean, they're the, the field, that is. Um, and also, you know, the, the political and intellectual project of um, breaking that um, perceived and constructed gulf between feminists, um, you know, masculine is men, boys, women. I mean, it's just, it's just a really, really important project. So that's a comment. Thanks. Thanks, Elspeth and everyone else. Um, so next we have Sophia. You should be able to unmute yourself. Are people having trouble unmuting? I'll unmute. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you okay. hear me now? Yep. So uh, my question is actually for Grass. So I've I've heard your talk before, like in I think at the Brisbane conference. I think it's just a very interesting talk, and I find it interesting as well that I noticed there are the same phenomena in Taiwan. 
like misogynist men would like to call people who believe in feminism, like they are feminist peak or a female peak, or they would like to call them feminism or you can eat, like they are able to take all the benefit because they live in feminism. And I'm really, really thrilled to notice that there are such phenomenon in, in, in Australia as well. So my question is that when you mentioned like uh, those in Zadell, they are very interested in engaging with um, sexual racism and you also show us the men on curry sauce and just be quiet. And I just wonder if those sexual racism, could it be possible that contain certain um, certain truths, like certain uh, analysis about the racial problem that actually like happened to them? Is it possible to see it from this perspective? I just have this, yeah, this question in my mind. Yeah, definitely. No, it's a really great question, Sophia. Thank you. Um, and I think it's part of this whole work that I'm doing is, is being able to both uh, uh, have empathy and also realize that some of these problems are really real, you know, and even though I might not agree with their conclusions um, or their methods, um, that doesn't mean that uh, the sort of pain that they feel uh, is not valid, you know, um, and, and definitely part of that affirmativeness is being able to take that pain seriously and particularly in relation to that, um, to sexual racism, which is absolutely the case, right? Like sexual racism is definitely a thing that exists and it is complicated by a post-sexual revolution world, whatever that means, you know? Um, and it's also complicated by a more globalized world and all these sorts of things. Um, and while I might think that those problems are caused by other things, they're certainly not, they are connected, you know? Um, and one of the reasons that I use them in this, I talk about sexual racism in this paper is to try and complicate the incel. It's just this guy that we hate, you know, mm -hmm. because actually he, he's, you know, a person who is unhappy and um, whether or not f feminism is at fault is perhaps a different question, but um, yeah, so it's a, it's a really great point. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. So sorry, can I also ask one more question? Because I'm really interested in this topic. So like um, incel is kind of seen as a, victim or as a person who just complained. But like in Taiwan, I think people, when people kind of label themselves as incel, they have a certain um, like critical distance about this term as well. Like they are almost being just uh, having a self-marking. And I just wonder if you see this kind of behavior on the internet as well. So the people sort of say they're an incel as a kind of mocking thing about themselves yeah just kind of you know self mockery saying it for fun yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah, yeah. okay um, and it's a huge thing and and um i have friends who joke about it all the time we're like oh i guess i'm just gonna be an incel you know or um and and uh yeah you definitely see it a lot and so not everybody who um it's definitely a term that that is brought up in a lot of sort of uh like internet discourse mm -hmm. that um is both in, in fun and also with quite serious consequences for sure. Thank you. I think we have Rosemary Pringle now. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, uh, well, it's great to be here. Thanks for, for, for a fascinating afternoon. I'd like to come back briefly to Rowan Connell's work because she commented quite often about the uh, difficulty that feminists had in ever talking about uh, about heterosexual male pleasure. And uh, I guess in her case, there are obvious reasons why she would have difficulty with that. But it was, I mean, certainly something that was criticized in her work at the time, her inability to, to do that. But I mean, as she pointed out, I think it's been a much more general um, issue. And no, I mean, my question is really to any of, any of the paper givers who'd like to, comment about, you know, about whether this is still an issue. I mean, how do we talk about boys' sexual pleasure? I mean, I mean, I mean, I take it in ways that don't assume that they're all potential rapists or, or, that, 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 they're, or that the essence of their sexual pleasure is in somehow dominating women. Uh, and are there ways of sort of, you know, going into this without uh, making them feel castrated, which seems to be the uh, alternative? Um, so I guess I, I, I'll say something 
uh, quickly in response, but this is probably Grace's area <laughs> in, some, in some ways. Sorry, Grace. Um, but then, you know, I, I think we, we could all in different ways talk about the fact that it, it's obviously necessary to be able to talk about um, a, a more a fuller, more detailed version of the experience of both boyhood and the idea of boys um, that allows there to be, yes, pleasures that are super diverse. So I'll do Stranger Things again, just because that's the example I'm going to use for this article. Um, so there is like the incredibly, there is incredible violence in some of the boys um, and some of it is directed towards girls but then many other boys are not like that at all and also have their own experiences and own narratives of falling in love and of aspiring to love and of desire and yeah so it's 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 not reducing it all to the logic of the same where everything there has to be our definition of male sexuality um, that everyone experiences because we certainly know that's not true about female sexuality or girl sexuality. Mm. So I'll leave that to any, anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I, I'll jump in because I think um, Tim Staines and I were thinking almost about the inverse of this question in relation to the text we were looking at where the boys were kind of depicted as being, as enjoying the violence that they were being, that they were participating in or being encouraged towards that that experience was one of like at best they were neutral but you know there was also this sense in the text that unchecked they would enjoy this and and that in fact there was some sort of uh, um yeah some some pleasure that they were gaining from it and so i guess what we tim and i were thinking about was about how could we think about the fact that sometimes the things that feminism thinks boys enjoy boys might not enjoy and sometimes the things mm. that feminism doesn't want boys to enjoy, you know, like there's something about, yeah, that almost the, the inverse of what um, your question was, I think, Rosemary, but that is yeah. along a similar vein. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Anybody else on that? Okay, we'll move on then to uh, Mia. Oh, hi. Um, so my question is primarily to Grace, but potentially uh, the rest of you will have things to add on to that. And it might also potentially tie into what uh, Rosemary was just asking. Um, so I was interested in that idea of like boy as a category um, and how that ties into um, subjecthood and this idea of like kind of constructing um, victimhood in the identity and contrasting the incel to something like men going their own way, which very much mobilizes men in the title. And it's all about kind of, kind of in seldom but like chosen in seldom and i wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that can you tell me more about what men going their own way is so from my understanding it's kind of like like men who are rejecting these like um rejecting the idea of having relationships and that kind of thing and so it's kind of like that idea of like voluntary celibacy but not really and I think that they are there are opportunities for you to have sexual encounters but like they must be kind of separate from relationships and that kind of thing right right and are the kind of people who do that is is it like um the kind of people who do that the kind of guys who do that are people who uh don't want to be held back by the sort of like curse of femininity is that the idea yeah, they've got I think they've got very similar concerns to incels but they're oh. framing it in a different way right so they're framing it as not like the personal um slight on themselves in which they can't um get a girlfriend but this they don't want to they would if they wanted to but they don't want to yeah um, i'm actually not clear i think potentially some people might right like right. they're kind of like getting ahead of the curve <laughs> like right. almost right. like i i was there before you do yeah. but i think there's probably a mix in there so i because i don't know exactly what you're talking about but thank you for the recommendation that's really interesting i think that the main thing I would say is that incels are very invested in the idea that they cannot um, escape the, the situation that they're in. Um, one of the only ways it seemed to be possible to escape is by having, uh, like I mentioned in my talk, really, really quite advanced reconstructive surgery um, to give yourself a face that is more like a Chad. 
Um, and actually that cut piece is quite heartbreaking because at the end of it, there's um, a particular figure who has a huge amount of plastic surgery and then finds that he can't get a girlfriend still. Um, and so uh, there's definitely this kind of in incredible kind of victimhood that's associated with being an incel, which seems different from the, the people that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, we have Ish next. I can mute. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all, firstly. And I want to say it's very intimidating to speak on this um, forum, but I'll go for it anyway. Um, I wanted to I was speak to Justin Tim's talk. I was walking with a friend yesterday who's she's 27 and she's got an 11-year-old son. Um, so obviously there's a lot of hard work there. And um, I always like to tell her that she's the perfect feminist and she was saying she's getting to a point where as a mother it's like re first she firstly she like rejects it but secondly she's saying like as a mother it's getting really really difficult because she always tries to like break the cycle with her son Isaac because she's from um like a lot of domestic violence and whatnot so she's found that in her like trying to break it and always have open communication with him and talk to him he said the other day oh but all men are bad and it just came to a point where she's like, oh no, now I've put him in that thing where he just thinks he's on a one-way trajectory to, um, yeah, pretty much this unstoppable cycle. I don't really have a question. I just kind of more, as you were talking, all I could think about was my friend and talking about her son and then her 11 year old son who she's trying to be so cautious of breaking the cycle with then says, just pretty much admits, you know, that's, that's, He's a man and he's bad and that's gonna what's gonna happen. Thanks, Ish. Tim, did you have thoughts? Did you I've spoken already if you want to jump in? All right, follow you. I'm still putting some thoughts together if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um yeah, so one of the things that we've noticed about these ad campaigns um is that well, I'll just talk about the stop it at the start ones really, because they're the ones that are um kind of directed towards uh, getting parents to think about intervening in everyday interactions in the name of violence prevention. So the other ones are all about like scenes where domestic violence is happening and the action that's being prompted is professional help seeking of some kind. So it's about like either violent people who use violence seeking help from therapists or women reaching out for help if they're experiencing is really getting people to question things like, um, you know, belittling ways that they speak about girls or women in front of their sons or the ways that they minimise um, everyday forms of uh, almost like minor, minor acts of violence. So, you know, a boy gets in trouble for flicking a girl's skirt up in one of the um, ads and his dad's like, that's all you did? That's, you got a detention for that? So it's about, minim it's about intervening in those everyday um, moments of sexism. But what's interesting is that... The, those clips stop short of giving parents any kind of template template for how you do it. So it points to the problem, but it doesn't offer any kind of a script for it. Whereas the ones that are about violence um, prevention, uh, where domestic violence is already playing out, those actually depict the people seeking help. So you get a, after the kind of big flash sign of the slogan comes up, you get a little moment of a scene where the, the man is sitting down with the therapist or the woman is speaking to her friend. So you get the kind of what you could do next thing. Whereas the Stop It at the Start campaign points the problem out to parents, but it gives no script or no point of intervention specifically toward the boys. So for the girls, the parents sometimes turn to the girls and say, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant, or no, no, like you shouldn't accept violence, but there's no modeling for how you have whatever the other version of that conversation would be with the boy children. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm super interested in that question as well. I think uh, the next thing that I wanna look at is some of the education campaigns that get used in schools that are supposed to be about intervening in that conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Tim, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, just a little bit, I guess I've got some disconnected thoughts here, but yeah, I think there is a lot of anxiety about what that conversation looks like, or what the conversation with the boy looks like, and a lot of indeterminacy about how to have that conversation as well. Um, I, I was kind of quite struck by Rosemary's question 
um, and how do you talk about boys' sexual pleasure when a lot of the ways that sexual pleasure for heterosexual boys has been constructed and perhaps learned is, is a power relationship. Um, and, you know, even in, I guess, in the work that I'm teaching now in gender studies, we're thinking about um, sexuality and its relationship to power. And how, how do you talk about that when we have these ways, we have these kinds of feminist um, forms of education that are teaching us and boys that some aspects of that power relationship are problematic at the same time as we have other kind of like um, sex positive kind of discourses that think about ethical ways of um, negotiating those power relationships too, um, which makes it tricky um, to have that conversation with boys. I think what they're uncertain, I think, or at least, um, yeah, maybe they're uncertain relationships with those power dynamics. How do we actually talk about them? How do we acknowledge them without shutting them down to the point where we're saying it's always bad and all men are bad or all male impulses are bad. Um, I think that's a really complicated thing. And as just said, it's not something that is represented in the ad. That conversation is never represented. It's a bit of a gap. And yeah, I would also love to think more about what that conversation might look like. Right, we have um, Azra now. Hi everyone. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yep, we can. Perfect. Um, thank you for for the presentations. First, uh, I was just thinking about uh, the basic definitions. Uh, of course, I'm not a scholar of masculinity, but I was thinking about the basic basic definitions of gender, and I was wondering if there's some kind of violence inherent in the definition of how we define men and women in our society and if we could say that that violence extrapolated in our relationships uh, when we talk about domestic violence and things like that so that was the first thought that was coming to my mind when i was listening to tim's uh, tim's presentation and uh, when i was listening to grace i was wondering about uh, what she expressed as empathy towards in cell members uh, and their victimhood or their sense of victimhood. Uh, my research is mostly based on genocide and when we look at perpetrators of genocide, there's always this sense of victimhood in perpetrators and that's how they justify their victimization of so many people. Uh, so the word of empathy how far does it bring us in our discussion? Uh, where does it bring us in our discussion? That was a question that I was thinking about for Grace. Uh, I would appreciate some kind of response, thanks. Uh, well, I might start off then. Um, you know, I guess my, my initial thought is that it, it hopefully doesn't get us very far. It doesn't get us too far, you know? Um, I think that, uh, I think for me, it, it gets me far enough to think critically and not dismiss um, the kinds of complexities of what's going on here. But, and also a, a recognition that a huge amount of incels or people who identify with the term, um, you know, uh, aren't terrible people and, and aren't going to do terrible things necessarily. Um, but I'm very hesitant to, um, yeah, to, to follow any kind of empathy too far. And I'm quite conscious of that as I work. Yeah. Um, was, your, was your first question about the violence of representation also, that, that seemed to be building a little bit, maybe on, on some of my paper. Um, I, I think that the issue that you've raised has been discussed a lot in um, feminist film studies in terms of Yep. semiotics of, and like how it moves and the sense in which there is there are in particular films a kind of a priori alignment with male characters or a sense obviously through Laura Mulvey that that the camera can do some of that work um I mean I guess I'm interested in the term mateship because it, I mean it's not as though in films people are using the words masculinity and femininity all of the time right they're using other words and so the question is like what work are those other words Doing and I do think that mate and mateship are, are interesting words in terms of I don't think they're physically violent, but I think that they can be called upon in moments where people feel so uncomfortable about violence or uncomfortable about structures of coercion. 
that it's about being like, oh, well, this is just the way it has to be, right? There's a certain resignation that's like, okay, well, mates being mates or, or boys being boys. So I think that that language can enter in maybe to obfuscate violence, which doesn't mean that every usage of that, those terms are in themselves violent. Maybe that, that responds to your question. Thank you. Okay, we have um, a final question uh, from Kane. Um, thanks. Um, so I was thinking about, thanks for some great papers and a really thoughtful discussion as well. I was uh, thinking about um, the sort of temporality of Jess and Tim's paper and this sort of sense in which um, the category of the boy is sort of um, enacted as this space, this sort of space that happens before or proto or, you know, pre-masculinity, pre some sort of encounter with, with toxic masculinity in this case. Um, and, and so it becomes a sort of position um, on the basis of which, you know, boys negotiate with the terms of, in this case, toxic masculinity. And I started thinking about um, Shauna, the topic of Shauna's paper and Shauna's discussion and, and particularly sort of the category of the tomboy, right? And where the tomboy might fit within a discussion of trans masculinity, because uh, it's quite tempting given that sort of temporality of boyishness to think of um, the tomboy as somebody who is kind of different from the, the, the trans masculine trans dude <laughs> in the sense that they, um, they're in a space of negotiating with entering into you know, um, um, endocrinological, endocrinological uh, masculinity, like mature masculinity. Um, and uh, so I'm, I just wondered what people thought about this, the category, like whether the category of the boy is, is um, uh, can be thought of in terms of a, um, a moment um, of, in which, you know, certain subjects are about to enter into masculinity, but there's a complex negotiation taking place. Um, so I guess I have something to say about that briefly, but then maybe others would like to. Um, and that would be that in a, not, not before masculinity, because it's not as if, for example, anyone thinks that uh, girls or girlhood identities or identifications are before femininity. Um, so I don't think the boys or boyhood are before femininity as if it's something that's just like some sort of Freudian end of latency story. Um, I, I don't think that at all, but rather I think that there's, that not in a parallel, um, because I think they're, they're quite, they, they seem to me to be quite different, but I think that boy, um, or the idea of the boy or the experience of boyishness or boyness, I think all of those things have a different uh, set of options when it comes to masculinity than, um, than are attributed or um, associated with adult men. So I, I think it, there are a different set of choices and a different set of options and a different set of things that are foreclosed on um, for not for all boys but for different boys in different contexts but i do think there is a sort of um a, in, in talking about boys and talking about boyishness there is a sort of presumption that you're um not yet foreclosed on not yet uh, um, placed in all of the things that are associated with adult masculinity so i'll just say that for now but obviously that's something that i'm thinking about rather than something that i think i have like tons of answers for right now but the other thing I want to say is I'm like super not keen on the concept of toxic masculinity um, just for the pigeonhole that it becomes and for how much it, it, it limits how, what you can see in a, in a given situation. That's it. I'm going to stop now. Maybe I'll just um, say something. Um, I'm thinking about, um, I mean, Kane's questions, Kane's questions about uh, the category of boy thought of in terms of the moment, and perhaps it's a question about how we might think of um, the continuity between um, different categories of boy and boyhood. So I've, I've not been thinking so much in terms of temporality in the way that Jess and Tim have, uh, but I'm also thinking about the materiality of um, 
bodies, right? Um, and I think I'm trying to really ambitiously work my way through um, critical queer and transgender studies, critical race and um, social science and technology studies um, to, to recuperate and um, affirm uh, sort of the vitalism of bodies, right? especially minority bodies. Do we think these bodies um, not as... Um, um, not as who is more victimized, right? But as having a kind of um, imminent vital force to produce multiplicities, multiplicities, right? Not just for recontextualization in the social, but also for a more radical um, deconstruction of sex and gender when bodies mutate, right? Whether one is whether whether through the figure of the tomboy or the butch with um, with the um, vest binding technologies, or whether it's transgender bodies. Um, um, yeah, so I'm thinking about um, more in terms of the materiality of bodies and the ways in which um, they mutate um, gender, sex, as well as race um, um, in the way that um, queer bodies do. And so that's, that's sort of my way of thinking about the continuities between, uh, between, different, between be different figures and different bodies. Can I just quickly tack on there too? I think the figure of the tomboy is a really interesting way um, it's an interesting kind of like, um, yeah, object for stretching the way we've already thought about what we've so far. Um, and just on the sort of topic of temporality, yeah, so the next kind of bit of research that I said that I would be interested in doing is thinking about um, the relationship of the boy within the man. Um, and I guess, you know, we've, I've sort of looked at literature that talks about how masculinity is about a sort of... Uh, disavowal of femininity, but what does it also mean to think about it as the disavowal of boyhood? Um, and what does it mean to um, negotiate or re-encounter or revisit boyhood for men? Um, I'm really, because that obviously breaks this temp that temporal kind of boundary between boyhood and manhood. Um, so that's something that I would like to look at in the future. Could I jump in and say something extra about, um, maybe about or the way that um, manhood is, is, or masculinity, adult masculinity is imagined in relation to children and representation of boys. But I think there's something really interesting about the cultural specificity of what sorts of um, masculinity are, are visible or available. And I think you get a really sharp contrast in Australian cinema and media with representations of um, young Aboriginal boys and, and children. So in films like Satellite Boy or In My Blood It Runs, um, from last year, or Samson Delilah, or similar, you get like a scene of films or even a cycle where there is a sense in which important moments of those young boys are, are not necessarily about what their relationship is going to be to older Aboriginal men, um, but also their relationships to white masculinity, which is sometimes not even present, or it's only present in its effects on their communities, but not um, embodied. Uh, so I think there's also something really interesting. Those, those films have a completely different sense of temporality about what those kids can do. And, and there's much work of them to invent their, their own stories, their own futures, um, with, with not clear models presented. Um, so I guess there's something interesting about the cultural and or racialized context in which those, those stories become visible or available. Okay, it seems like everyone, anyone else? Question? No? Okay, well then we might have reached the end. Liam, did you have anything? Oh, that's great. Thanks everyone for sticking around and thanks for all the papers, team. <laughs>